Men come from all over the world for some male bonding, cheap beer, and even cheaper women. The women they buy are no more than teenagers, impoverished young women trying desperately to survive. The men may be young or old, attractive or not, it's irrelevant. In the Philippines, their money makes them kings. Milo works at Heaven, a little bar on Blowjob Alley. And like thousands of other bar girls in Angeles, Mila lives in tremendous hope that someday one of these foreigners will rescue her. Pwede mo sabihin ngayon sa akin kung ano ang pangalan mo? Mila. Mila. Mila ano? Samora. Samora. Yung main talaga ng pangalan mo. Saan ka nang galing? Anong probinsya ka galing? Saan ka saan probinsya ka galing? Sa Pangasinan. Pangasinan. Parang kami. Mm -mm. Saan? Dito. I do some interviews with the women and then uh, of course as the start of uh, you know organizing them, you do some uh, you know chatting with them so that getting to know each other so that they will be able also to know me and familiarize my face and uh, you know who I am also. What is my role there? Uh, why, why am I there? Ano oras ka daw ano kumapasok? Ano yung dati? Alas is... Alas is na umaga? Ten o'clock the morning. Hanggang ano oras? Ten o'clock the morning. Hanggang back for a cup. Four o'clock in the morning also. We come back, we come home at four o'clock in the morning. Okay. Who is this? Boyfriend. Boyfriend from America. America. Mm -hmm. Where did you meet her? Him. Uh, Alan. Alan. Si Alan, come on. Mm, this is Alan. Up to now, yes. Bon penal mo pa rin siya ngayon. Mm. I come back December. Ah. He will come back in December. And this is you. Okay. Very nice. This is Alan. Mila. This is Mila. To some extent, they live a fantasy. They live a fantasy that someday some white man is going to fall in love and take her home with him and certainly that happens enough times you know maybe as much and many, maybe as many times as a young black youth in the u.s gets to make the nba that that dream is one that keeps them reinforced stephen works with agnes on a canadian funded development project they're helping the police educate the public about the prostitutes living in their midst. Our source speaker is none other than Dr. Steve Perot. I'm involved in this project, uh, Sex Trade in the Philippines, in Angeles City, um, in my role as a psychologist at Mount St. Vincent University, and also because I spent 10 years as a police officer in Halifax Regional Police. I mean, one of the ideas was was that in a society like the Philippines, which is still quite hierarchical, it was important to have somebody who would have some credibility with the male police officers to lend some extra credibility to the project, um, to provide, I think, maybe a different image of foreign men than they're used to. Also working with Stephen and Agnes, our project interns Jessica and Angela. Fresh out of university and full of idealism, 
they're going to change the world. Since I've been here, I've just wanted to make, you know, have this big dream of making some kind of macro level change and changing the lives of not just individual women, although it's nice to have a rapport with them and have individual relationships with them, but to make a bigger change to affect all of the women and however unrealistic that is, it's, I think it's really necessary for my, you know, state of mind to think that I can in some way help with a big change that can happen here. I wanted to become an intern because my degree is International Development Studies and I've always been fascinated with traveling and new experiences and dealing with new cultures. My main goal of the job is to interview as many of the women as possible and do it in a light that they trust me. I find it very important to build up that trust and build up a friendship. And the bottom list takes up about two pages. And there's a really something interesting that they say. Did you read under Shadow's Minibar? It says Shadow's Minibar. All the right elements are here. First and foremost are the go-go bars full of sexy young dancers. There are over 50 go-go bars full of attractive and readily available women eager to show you a good time. Valley Bay was a non-stop party year-round. Recreational sex is a sport of choice. You can get loaded and laid regardless of your age, sex, physical appearance, interpersonal skills, wealth, or social class. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. Well, I think we've all seen those back there. A lot of the customers that I have been able to talk to, uh, I've been very disturbed by talking to them. Very, very sexist ideas, very, very racist ideas. They degrade the woman a lot. Uh, one of my favorite places to go and talk to the women is Shadow Star. I was up there at one point talking to them and this uh, customer came in, sat down, and the girls stiffened. They knew who he was. And they were all whispering in my ear, like, don't talk to him. He's not a nice person. You know, just, just avoid him. And at one point, he was going around saying, and who's going to be the lucky woman I get to sleep with tonight? And he was pointing to each one of them, you? Maybe you? No, not going to be your turn tonight. And pointing to the next person, you? Could it be you? No, not going to be with you tonight. So I just tried to continue to ignore him. And then he pointed at me, he's like, well, I especially wouldn't sleep with the white woman. And I turned around and I, I just wanted to say, like, you don't have enough money in the world to sleep with me. And I opened up my mouth and I bit my tongue literally to stop myself because that would be indirectly insulting the women. It's interesting walking in the fields I have in your area or anywhere in this city as, as a white man because immediately you are a customer. To walk and meet these men, some of these men wave to me or wink at me on the street because they know we're, they figure I'm up to the same game and we're playing this macho game. And, you know, I saw a man you know, 65 years old walking with a young woman, 20 years old, hand in hand. I can understand he doesn't want to get old, but that happens. And the fact that he can't draw the line between some fantasy in his head, if his fantasy comes at the cost of such exploitation, he's gotten so far away from any sense of morality a human being can have on either moral grounds or human rights grounds. Here, I 
share a sense of shame for being a white man in a country where white men do nothing but buy bodies of young women. For the first time I met Mila, I was walking down East Santos, and she just started walking with me. I was curious. And I see her a couple times a week, and she's so friendly and so loving. Sometimes I'm wondering, like, why is she so friendly? Is it, is it because she doesn't get enough general affection? Is the only affection she's shown connected with people buying sex? And she's not, she's not worried about that with me. She knows that it's not going to be an exploitative relationship. When she first met Steve, she was very shy. She wouldn't even look him in the eye. And then she got used to him very quickly and realized, no, he's a friend. Buying sex is not the reason he's here. And now she just loves him. She'll run up and give him a big hug, just the same as with me. So I, I think it's, I think it's connected with the affection is with people that she doesn't have to worry about being exploited against. Ah, uh, meron ka, meron ka bang na na amit na foreigner na salbahe? Meron ibang aso, na ibang mabait, ganun. Uh, you know, uh, when she works in the Duke of York, she was forced to, uh, even if she's sick, she was forced to go to the customer. And then what happened? No, na nang pabagot ako. Napakunat ako. Sabi na ka, maroon na ka magdudya. Sabi ko, no. Sabi ko, I do great. Sabi niya, boom boom. Iyaw niya ako, yung tunay niya ako. Siya na mga boyfriend ako. Umuwi ako aircon. Namamatay na ako. Sabi niya. Mila is 21, and though she looks and acts much younger, she's already had a lifetime of experiences. At the age of 12, she was sent from the provinces to work in Manila as a housemaid. A few years later, she was recruited, or enticed as they say here, to work in a factory. The woman who brought her from Manila took her to a bar and then disappeared, leaving her all alone. The woman probably sold her. Mila was only 17. She had no money, and she didn't speak the local language. She's been working in the bars ever since. A maid at 12, a prostitute at 17. It's almost unimaginable. And yet Mila's story is not uncommon. I come here and... I'm 25, but I'm, co I'm come here and cherry girl, about 14 years old, but I don't know. I said my friend, she's so working in a restaurant, but me is not good because it's working in the, I know, the bar, that's why. And then uh, it's hurt because I lost my cherry in the bar. A lot of the women have been uh, raped or sexually harassed, sexually assaulted, and this is a common theme that runs through them. And a lot of the women have said, well, I wasn't a virgin anymore, I wasn't worth anything. You know, in the Philippines, we have this patriarchal uh, system wherein we look up on the men while women are just the second-class citizen. That's why if uh, the man uh, goes to the bar, it's, just, it's even, you know, an ego for them, you know, because they are really they, this macho, you know. They prove themselves that they are really man.
The Philippines was colonized by the Spanish in the early 16th century and by the Americans in 1898. Filipinos joke that they've had 400 years in the convent and 100 years in Hollywood. Such a unique colonial history, and particularly the imposition of the Roman Catholic Church, has had dire consequences for women. Family planning is discouraged, and women are judged by their marital and virginal status. Men are free to pursue mistresses, prostitutes, or so-called minor wives with impunity. The Philippines is a land of striking contrast. Great beauty, wealth, and resources, alongside tremendous poverty and destitution. I think the girls become bar girls because they have no choice. You know, if the choice is to live in extreme poverty or be a bar girl and make money, that's not a choice. And they do it because they need to, they need to survive and their families need to survive. And there's no social security net. If you don't have the money, then you starve. Mila is from Benmali, an old fishing village in the province of Pangansanan. One reason she became a bar girl is because of the poverty of her family. She is the fifth of ten children and only went to grade six. According to Filipino custom, the older siblings are responsible for the younger ones. So most of the money Mila makes is sent home to her family. Mila's agreed to take Agnes and her friend Feli who speaks the local dialect to meet her family in Benmali. When we are on our way to Pangasinan, she always uh, kept on telling me she's shy. Uh, she, um, she's very shy that we will see their situation and we will meet their par her parents. She told me that their house is very small and they have nothing to show us. They have no livelihood. Only the mother who is a laundry woman. That's why she's very shy. She was two years old. Uh, look at her back. She had a hunchback. Now she's seven years old. Uh, they cannot fix it anymore because, you know, she doesn't have money to treat this girl. I think uh, before the father was working as a helper in the fish farm, but now since he is a heart drinker, when we met there, he was drunk already. <laughs> Oh, 
Babalik kami sa Mayo. When we saw their situation, we'll, we'll just, uh, it's a pity. There was a time when she went home with her boyfriend and she introduced uh, him to the mother. He's also a foreign an American. But when he saw their situation, they parted. Maybe uh, some, uh, some foreigners uh, thought that uh, if you have a big family, you have to support them. Especially in the case of Mila, they are very poor. The city was home to the United States Clark Air Force Base from the Second World War until the early 1990s. It was the biggest American base in Asia, with more than 40,000 people stationed there at any given time. And where you have military men, you have lots of rest and recreation facilities. So all around the perimeter of the base, you see the sex industry, just for the foreign. Mount Pinatubo erupted in 1991, devastating Anhala City and the surrounding areas. The Americans abandoned Clark, but left all the infrastructure behind. The airstrips, living quarters, a state-of-the-art hospital, and of course, all the bars. Australians, retired Americans, and other Westerners bought up all the bars by marrying Filipino women. Military prostitution was quickly replaced by sex tourism on Fields Avenue. Prostitution is illegal in the Philippines, so officially there are no prostitutes. The women are called dancers, waitresses, hospitality workers, or GROs, guest relations officers. The girls don't have jobs, they have boyfriends. They don't go out on tricks, they are bar fined. If a woman is bar fined, a customer pays the bar owner to take her out. 15 minutes costs only a few dollars. The whole night is a thousand pesos, or 20 US dollars. And the girl gets half. In a country where the minimum wage is 150 pesos a day, this is an enormous amount of money. Okay. Another piece of the infrastructure left behind by the Americans is the social hygiene clinic. It was set up to make sure prostitutes were not infected with sexually transmitted diseases, so the military men would be protected. The clientele may have changed, but the system remains the same, operated now by the municipal government. Mila and the other 3,000 bar girls in Angeles are checked weekly for infections. After getting the test, which the women pay for themselves, they wear tags on their bikinis, proclaiming them clean. It's a catch-22 for the women. Since prostitution is illegal, but also regulated by the government, and a huge double standard since male customers are not registered, checked, or criminalized in any way. Though customers may think they're protected, the women are not treated for STDs systematically, and are only rarely tested for HIV. The Philippine government claims only 1,800 people in 20 years 
have tested positive for the virus. Human Rights Watch, however, predicts an explosion of HIV AIDS in the Philippines. Since the government has impeded access to condoms and cut funding for sex education, because the Catholic Church opposes both. So, after you get your pro book, health card, your health card, what do you do next? You go to the table. And what do you do at the then table? To, to know who you are, and then you, you are submitting for a smear. So, what are all these metal cold looking instruments? This instrument will be so there's a whole bunch of kids. And so, is there only one girl in this room at a time, or is there a few no. reading? Or? They, they, they fall like them, then one by one they sit the game. So at, at home, when women go for pap smears, it's a, it's a very personal private. Yes. So it's there's not the same privacy yes. here. There, there is no pap smear here. This is only smear. The smear. The pap smear is you hold it and let's take the same. So the difference between a smear and a pap smear? There is the difference of smear and pap smear. Because the smear is only where they finally look for your some venereal diseases. Now the pap smear is general cleaning. General cleaning if you have something like, for example, seeds, something like that. So the smear, it's, it's just a quick, quick yeah. smear. This quick smear, especially for it. You said there's there's cherry girls, virgins who come yeah. here every week as well. Right. So why do the uh, why do virgins who are working in the entertainment industry have to get a smear every week? Well, it's like this. We have a problem, so virgins telling us that she's a virgin. Now, some guys like virgin girls. They say, okay, I will marry you if you're a virgin, just like you did truth. So we will protect the establishment and the floor manager. That's the truth. So how, how, how I will know that you are a virgin or not? That is the main reason. Now, another reason is that all girls who work in the independent industry, especially in the industry, even if you are a virgin or not virgin, you submit. So is this set up partially or fully to protect the customers? Yes, of course. Because you know, there are a lot of discrimination with this kind of women. They look down on the women because they think that uh, the, these women are dirty women, you know, in particular. And, uh, you know, because, you know, you keep on going from one man to another and they, they look like uh, Mary Magdalene. I'm not sure what to say to them when they tell me that they're, they're raped by their father when they're 12. I'm not really sure how to react when they say that the worst thing about working in the bar fine is that you don't know the person, you may end up being killed. Miss my boyfriend, she like really good back class, she like short time, she like everything, everything you like, she like me, she said, give me or max. She killed me, the she same. Can, she killed me, uh, my friend. You must get that for me. No sleep for me. Oh my, five o'clock. She like, oh my, kill me. Oh my, shoot by the back club. Oh my, crying. Oh my, cry for me. It's hurt. Oh my, hurt. Oh my. For me, for me, not boyfriend. 
Bar girls have few options when they're too old to work. And they're old by the time they're 25. Most end up in squatter communities, living in extreme poverty, with their Amerasian children, half Filipino, half foreigner. Agnes works with women like Preciosa Colombiano, who lives in a slum with her Amerasian son, Paul. Paul's father was an American pilot who abandoned them more than 20 years ago. You and me, guys. How long ago was this? How long ago did you graduate? Three years. Three. Two. And uh, your Paul struggles to find the English word to describe what Amerasians like himself need as a result of being abandoned by their American fathers. What about you, Nanay? Uh, what's your experience being a mother of an Amerasian? Do you have any experience? Being a mother of the Amerasian? Do you encounter some, you know, I don't discrimination? Mind. Now, how do you how do you spend your life? Working hard? Yeah. Ah. So that they can they can income? for our daily needs. Mm -hmm. uh, sacrificing so much mm -hmm. to make my son big. Mm -hmm. uh, that's good. Another option for older bar girls is to become a mama son, a manager or pimp for the younger women. They arrange dates for the girls and collect bar fines from the men. Mila and Beth live in the back rooms of heaven with their mama son named Shirley. This is a picture of Beth. I'm here, son. Can you tell me about your job as a mama son? What you, how you, how you arrange deals for the girls? Explain that. So I work as a mama son. I'm going to sit there and put sometimes post to her and then ask the post for something to drink. And then if they have some good time, some head, that's all. Okay. So they, if they come here, they get mostly head here? Yeah, mostly over here. Okay. Why would a customer come here rather than fields? What would be the difference? I think that's a big difference. Some uh, in Pils Avenue, they, uh, they, uh, they, 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 if the guys uh, ask, uh, you know, how to make head, and then the girl, they said, no, I don't know how, but here, they said already. So the girls on fields make boom boom. Only. But here they give But here they give it. When one of your girls goes, is bar fine, mm -hmm. where do they go to have sex? Sometimes in the hotel. Okay. Never back here in, in the rooms? That's not what this is for. Mm -hmm. Okay. The final option for girls like Mila are the casas or brothels where the local Filipino men go. The girls are locked inside and a guard lets customers in every 15 minutes. In many ways, bar girls are much better off than the casa workers who get about 50 cents a customer and have up to 15 men every night. The Philippine National Police have just rescued 17 girls from a casa, 
all were tricked into coming to Anjales by recruiters in the provinces. Yes, the castle looks like uh, a, a shanty house. Where in in one place there is a little sal, living sal, uh, a sala, where in you can see the the pin or maybe the maintainer. Then once a client or a customer comes in, the pimps they will call in the ladies from their cubicle, and then they will line up there for them for the client to choose who will be his sex partner inside the cubicle. Once the lady was chosen, they'll go inside her cubicle and then that's it. Who can who could go there and see that kind of situation? No one will tell that that's fine. Imagine, as if they're they're slave. Imagine how they were treated when they were given their food. Oh, I, I'm I can I can't describe by as if you see a dog eating under the table. I guess the most disturbing thing is the trip into the castles. Uh, to go into the catacombs of the bowels of these castles, which are ugly enough to begin with. And you just go further and further back and you see young women, two of them living on a little cot on a piece of concrete. And to know that even in the middle of the night, if one of them is called upon to perform a sex act, she has to give up her bed to let this go on. Uh, to recognize that, that there is no way out of there that you could you could be born, live, and die in those catacombs. And that is very disturbing. I don't think that many can even visualize uh, how gut-wrenching being in there is. Okay. What kind of man could come in here? disgusted by humanity to see these girls living in rooms that were no bigger than eight feet by four feet two to a room living there 24 hours a day 
with nowhere to go um, was disgusting and I felt sick to my stomach and I wish I could have I wish I could have thrown up so that people would have known exactly how disgusted I was and I felt guilty when I left because it was like I was leaving them behind and I didn't I don't want anyone to feel like that and it makes me feel like not what I'm doing is useless but how much can I really achieve and what I'm doing is that the work that I'm doing with women isn't ever going to reach women who are so low on the totem pole. You know, I have this idea of prostitution and that wasn't it. That wasn't prostitution. That was something completely different. It was slavery. It was... It was the most horrid thing I've ever seen in my whole life. So how will Mila's story end? Will she become a mama son? A poor mother of an Amerasian? A casa worker? Or will she be one of the lucky few to escape with a foreigner? Mila got pregnant to uh, an American. I ask you, I ask her if you, you know, did you ever t tell this, uh, you know, this American that you're pregnant? She told me yes, but he did not promise anything about the pregnancy. <laughs> her, her hopes is that, uh, you know, to get another, you know, another foreigner to give her a good future. The hope doesn't just affect Mila and girls like her. All these children suffer as well. Some will end up in the bars. Some will find work in factories. But most will live out their lives in poverty. You know, actually, my vision, you know, is, is to go out of the country, to work there in the, outside the country while I am, uh, you know, raising funds with uh, other... I don't know if this is an impossible dream, you know? Uh, but uh, I do hope uh, someday it will be a, a possible dream. Before, Mila is hoping that Alan would marry her. But now, you know, when, when she got pregnant, because maybe she's a little bit uh, desperate, she's not hoping that anymore. <laughs>